Good evening to everyone joining us today from India, local time 7.30 p.m. Today we are here to celebrate World Space Week. October 4th marks the anniversary of the first made ma man-made object in space, Sputnik 1. I pass it on to Aditi, uh, my co-host today. I would like to quote Vladimir Zdanobikov, a cosmonaut, a Russian cosmonaut, who says that without women, we stood in once in space with only one leg. This quote symbolizes what we stand today, the World, Speak, World Space Week of 2021. Women's, collab, women's contribution in what we know as space industry today. So, I'll let pass on to Aditi for the next step. Aditi, are you here with us? Yeah. Hey all, how are you all doing? Evening for all the audience here in India. And ma'am, you can also participate if you would like to. So what Mentimeter is, is basically a real-time interface that allows you to vote on certain questions. So for today we have, how's everybody doing this fine evening? And that link should be in the chat or in the WhatsApp group that you might have joined. So we can see that everybody's doing great and cannot wait to get started. Haha, <laughs> feeling a little tired, but I will not miss this for the world. That's the same case for myself and Aditi as well. Great then. So thank you for participating in this small activity. Now, I would like to present another screen to talk more about what sets Nebula is. Okay. Um, Just yeah. a moment, Aditi. Yeah. Yes. Okay, for all those who have joined us for the first time, we would like to introduce our chapter, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, so that is SETS, is an international student organization whose purpose is to promote space and exploration and development through educational and engineering projects. SETS is fostering the development of future leaders and contributors in the expanding space industry. In SETS Nebula, which is a sub-chapter of SETS India, we work in three different teams, namely core, outreach, and project. Under the core department, we organize all our in-house events, such as this one. Outreach conducts awareness programs and specialized courses on space for the underprivileged students. And the project team, as the name suggests, develops space-based projects based on the applications of all the theory and engineering learned. That's for our chapter now. Now, I would like to welcome our speaker. Welcome, ma'am. It is an absolute honor for us to host you here at SETS Nebula, a chapter of SETS India's World Space Week celebration at Vellore Institute of Technology, Bhopal. And a very good morning to you as well, ma'am, for joining us to share her experiences, her knowledge, and most importantly, her valuable perspectives on some of the most vital and pertinent topics in the 21st century. We're lucky to have you here. Now, I would like to invite our president, Ms. Sakshi Nagayach, to introduce our guest, the first woman engineer in an operational capacity at NASA Mission Control. Over to you, Sakshi. Uh, sure. Thank you, Nagayach. Uh, good morning to you, ma'am, and good evening to all of you. I want to start by saying thank you for joining us as our guest for the first event to celebrate World Space Week. At the age of 25, Ms. Frances became the first female engineer to work in NASA's mission control, an achievement that allowed her to understand the continuous and subtle discrimination women faces in scientific community. She, she, she has made it her mission to ensure that space is a place for everyone with a heart where they can dream and dream the impossible. Her mission in NASA includes calculation to return flight to the Earth trajectories in Apollo 8, and also a key role play helping retrieve the astronaut who narrowly survived in Apollo 13 disaster. Today, she is a Texas attorney. She began her career as a computerist and transitioned into a full-time 
women's rights advocate her past defines her present and that is what we celebrate with her in this event once again ma'am i would like to welcome you and thank you for making your time for us now i would like to hand it over to our host who will guide the event further thank you thank you sakshi so before we get started uh, as the host for today we would like to also point out that there's an astro photography competition prepared for our audience and also our followers in, in on our social media if you're an amateur photographer mesmerized by the night sky this is a cup of tea the topics and more information will be shared later at the end of the event please stick around to know more about it also we'd also like as this interaction with miss frances northcurt is more about what she believes and what she wants to share and also what we want to know more about we'd also encourage the audience to ask questions now how would you be asking questions in the same mentimeter link that i had my team had shared previously there should be an option for you to ask questions so at the end of the event where we are done with the initial section of the talk we'll also be presenting your questions to the guest as well over to you aditi Ma'am, I would also like to start this event by quoting a few words you described yourself with. Something that has stuck with me from the moment I heard it one of your interviews. Uh, you said uh, about yourself that you are a one-time scientist, a sometime lawyer, and a full-time women's rights advocate. Miss Frances Northcutt, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and happy Space Week to all of you. Uh, My understanding is it's in the evening time where you are uh, after seven o'clock at night. So I hope you've had your dinner, or will be looking forward to it soon. Where I am, I'm in Houston, Texas, and it's just after nine in the morning. And that reminds me of fifty-three years ago on this day. Would have been a Friday. And at about this time of day, I would have been sitting down in my office across the street from NASA uh, at a company called TRW Systems. It was a contractor to NASA. I never worked for NASA itself. I always worked for a contractor, and <clears throat> I would have probably stumbled into the office about eight thirty in the morning. We were supposed to be there about eight. Our regular office hours were eight to five, except nothing was regular about what we were doing. Since I probably had been there until nine or ten o'clock the previous night, I had the liberty to be a little late in the morning. So first thing in the morning, I would get there, and like I'm doing this morning, I would have my coffee cup, and I'd be drinking a little coffee, and I'd probably scan the newspaper. Now, 1968 was a really difficult year. It had been a difficult year all year, okay, uh, for the United States in particular and for the world in general. Uh, it had started off just terrible. There was some submarine that vanished, atomic submarine that vanished. I don't know if they ever figured out what happened to that U.S. submarine. Uh, We were mired in a seemed like an endless war in Vietnam. Every night on the news, you'd see body bags, you'd see coffins coming off uh, uh, the airplanes, bringing back dead soldiers. Uh, it had some serious all all assassinations are serious, but these were in really devastating assassinations in the United States. Martin Luther King, who was a very notable notable black leader, civil rights leader, had been assassinated. There's a lot of civil rights unrest. Then Bobby Kennedy, uh, the brother of John F. Kennedy, was running for president, and he was assassinated. Again, a big upheaval. There was a little bright spot if you were a woman, as I was, and that was the. Yale University had announced that for the first time they were going to let women go to college there. Um, the Beatles were at their prime, but all in all, it was a tough time. So for me, uh, I kept up with world events. 
Uh, and I was particularly aware of the women's rights movement, which was starting at that time. It had been going for a few years. And I was aware of it because I was only woman in TRW in Houston who was a member of the technical staff. But here it is, and it's like nine o'clock in the morning, and I've read the newspaper. So now I'll start working. And I'll look at my desk, which is stacked high with printouts. Uh, green bar paper is what we call the computer printouts. We didn't have all of these video things everywhere. Uh, and I had stacks and stacks because what I was going to be doing all day, what I'd been doing all the previous day, all the previous week, all the previous months, was testing, 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 and more testing. You see, back in the middle of the summertime, I, I heard a rumor, and I thought, this is a crazy rumor. I'd heard a rumor. The chatter was that we were going to go to the moon in December. Now, I knew that this was a crazy rumor, that it could not possibly be true, because I worked on the Return to Earth program. It was called the abort program initially, but I worked on the return to earth program and you aren't going to the moon unless you can come back, right? And our program was not ready. So I heard these rumors and I thought, well, this is just insanity because we can't possibly go, go to the moon because we don't, we're not ready to get back. And then in August, the announcement was made, yes, they're going to do this. So it was nothing but a crash effort from that time until the mission. And it was testing and retesting and testing over and over again to make sure that the program was not going to fail. The, the, the return to earth program is, is, well, it's the solution to the three body problem, which is a very complex thing. It's a whole lot harder to get back to the earth and the moon than it is to get back to the earth from earth orbit. And one of the complications was that over in the mission control center, where you have the flight controllers, they had no familiarity at all with that capability. They, they were called retro fire officers okay well that's how you get back from earth orbit you retro fire you slow the spacecraft down and you will get back to the earth gravity will take care of that problem but coming back to the earth from the moon you don't retro fire and it's not as easy as slowing down the spacecraft because you've got the moon pulling on you, you've got the earth pulling on you, you've got a tug of war going on. And the astronauts could not even calculate a return to earth on board the spacecraft because it's too hard a problem. Um, there's no closed form solution to it. People see the movie Hidden Figures and they think we did this on the back of an envelope. No way that you do something like a return to Earth on the back of an envelope uh, or with a hand calculator. You have to have a computer. You have to. It would just not be possible otherwise. Because our program, which we worked on for years, was an analytic math model to start the integrator so that you could actually come back and land, arrive, not we didn't land on land, but re-enter and arrive pretty much where you wanted to be. And tiny little error in doing your maneuver, if you're at the moon or close to the moon, a tiny error propagated across those distances means you can miss the earth entirely with errors that would be negligible if you're talking about coming back from earth orbit. So the precision that's involved was just orders of magnitude greater. And the, the, the whole 
feel of the numbers was different. They behaved differently. So the retrofire officers over in Mission Control, they hadn't a clue how any of this stuff looked, you know, at all. So we were suddenly presented with the requirement that we had to go over and work in Mission Control to help the retrofire officers. That was not part of my job description. So it was a total surprise to me. And pretty intimidating to go over there, put on the headphones. You've got all these consoles. You've got, I don't know how many comm lines coming in at you. you you typically would tune into maybe five of them. It's this cacophony of noise coming at you. And you've got all these screens. You're having to figure out what's on all of these screens. And then, of course, I discovered I'm the first woman that's ever been in this place in an operational mission support role. And uh, consequently, I got a lot of press attention. I got a lot of stares. And then one day when I'm simulating, you know, we're over there simulating, I kept hearing chatter over the headphone uh, from one of the, ch they kept saying, look at what's on channel, whatever, 51 or whatever, look at, and I would hear these remarks about, you won't believe what's on channel 51. Well, one day I thought, I wonder what is on channel 51. So I dialed it up and it was me. There was a camera that was just on me. Now talk about feeling self-conscious. That was the first thought that hit my mind. But the side of mind wasn't really so much to be angry, but just to just say to myself, well, okay, I'm here, I'm a woman, get used to it, okay? These guys are gonna look at you. So that was my attitude and eventually they did, okay? But it was pretty, you know, uh, startling to discover that I was the subject of just, you know, being on camera the whole time. Uh, I never said anything about it to anybody. Uh, I didn't want to get anybody in trouble. And I came to the real realization that, you know, I was sort of like the purple cow, a giraffe in the room, you know, I was just an oddity. And eventually they would get used to me and, and that would stop. And it did. Uh, but women today still have that kind of experience of feeling like they're the, you know, they're the only one. We also have people of color that will have that same experience. They're the only one and they feel like people are staring at them and they are, okay? They are. Uh, and you have to learn to handle that and to have confidence in yourself that they'll get over it, okay? You are an oddity and you know, you were in a room full of people that looked like you, and then there was the one that didn't, you too would probably be staring a little bit. But it was a, a, a wonderful experience to work in Apollo 8. I had started out as a computerist, which is uh, a tech aide. I had a degree in mathematics from the University of Texas. And uh, at that time, women were not expected to really work outside the home at all. Or if they did, if they had a college degree, just to be a secretary or a nurse or uh, maybe a school teacher. Uh, so the expectations for women were very low, but our society was changing. I ran to work as a computerist. I ran a lot of data and I was really interested in the data that I was running. And you can learn a lot by looking at the data. And uh, I, I was someone who looked at the data and I wanted to know what it meant. And why were we looking at this data? What were we doing with this? Why was it behaving this way? I would come in every day and I had a bunch of questions. And before long, I knew an awful lot about what we were doing because I was hands-on with the data and I was asking questions. And then 
you know, I had been there maybe three months when I decided I'm as smart as these guys. I can do what they're doing. And eventually I was promoted and made a member of the technical staff and worked on this return to earth program the whole time I was there and ended up as the first woman in mission control, something I never expected. I worked on Apollo 8, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And the return to earth program that I was involved developing was there for all of those missions. You know, after five, Five missions, the retrofire officer didn't need us there holding his hand every day. But uh, the work was there and brought every astronaut safely back to the Earth from the moon. And that was the whole goal. Uh, it was a very exciting experience. And uh, I watch with great interest as we try to go back to the moon. And I'm also very uh, excited to see that when I look at pictures in the control center these days, a lot of times I see a whole lot of women, not just one. And I also see a lot of people of color as well, which is great too, because uh, there were no people of color in mission control when I was there. It was a very white male environment. So very exciting to me to see uh, much more diversity. Uh, we all help hold up part of the sky. And, uh, you know, we all need to aim higher. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, were there any uh, instances where you felt that people underestimated you just because you were the only woman? in that organization in a technical role? Um, I never, I never really felt that. Uh, I think that, I, I think to, to a certain extent, you're probably talking about sort of this imposter syndrome of, of feeling like you don't belong and, and you're worried that people are judging you and so forth. Um, uh, I think that it was an advantage for me that I started as a computerist uh, rather than starting uh, as a member of the technical staff. And the reason it was sort of an advantage for me was that I spent a year in that role. So I knew all of the guys I worked with. And quite frankly, I knew I was smarter than at least half of them. <laughs> okay. So... You know, uh, and I knew that by the time I was promoted. So I didn't have any doubts that I belonged there. The other thing is that I did a lot. And one of the things that you, you can get a lot of self-confidence when you do that, uh, because we had, I just had a bachelor's degree in mathematics, okay? I did not have a master's or a PhD, but we had PhDs that worked on our on our task at times. In fact, I probably had the least uh, amount of uh, formal education on the team. But I could walk in and take something that they had developed that they said was perfect and would never fail and come in the same afternoon with an error printout, you know, that was three feet tall and show all of the ways that they had screwed up. And uh, routinely did that because they had, you know, th the big failure is uh, confirmation bias. Uh, and I learned early about confirmation bias uh, dealing with these folks. They, they forget that it's your tacit assumptions that will kill you. Uh, you know, if you, if you make a tacit assumption, you don't test for whether it's valid or not because it's tacit. So that's where your vulnerability is going to be. And, and I was just really good at identifying the things that they had assumed without proving and uh, could just blow their stuff up like crazy. 
which always brought them down a little bit. Okay. It, in, uh, I, I took it as a challenge. I would go in and I would see some really arrogant guy and he would say, oh, you're, I mean, this is perfect. I have tested it. You will, I mean, you're not going to find a thing popping. And then, as I said, that afternoon, it didn't even take me a day. The first run that I put into the computer, I could blow it up. Okay. So, you know, I, it, it was a great ego builder for me. We would also like to know about what was it like to work in all those Apollo missions you mentioned just now from 8 to 30. It was very tiring, okay? <laughs> very tiring. Uh, Apollo 8 was especially tiring, as was Apollo 13. Uh, 11, uh, for what I did, was not tiring at all. It was like a, you know, cruise on a, a cruise line. Okay. It was smooth sailing. Uh, as were 10 and 12. Uh, so, you know, the really difficult ones were eight and 13. The reason eight was difficult. I mean, first of all, it was the first mission that I had worked on. So that is a difficulty. But the other thing was that Technically, that was such a challenging mission because there were so many subsystems and systems that had never actually been flown before. And uh, one of the uh, problems was that there were mass concentrations on the moon that had never been mapped before. So uh, they were having to, you know, the, the spacecraft wouldn't exactly be in exactly where we thought it was. Uh, and was having to be updated all the time. So on that particular mission, as I said, they had no onboard capability to do a computation as complex as returning to Earth from the moon. So in that particular mission, every revolution before they went behind the moon and we lost communication with them, they would be read up to return to Earth maneuvers. One that they could do that passed behind the moon, and then a second one, okay, uh, for the next rev. And that was the big fear that we would lose communication with them, that something might happen. So we always wanted to have something that they had where they could do a return to Earth. So in that mission, I mean, we were just, once, once calm was acquired, once they came around from the back moon, and a vector was a, was was gotten on their position and direction. We were just, you know, running returns to Earth, running, running, running. Okay, trying trying to get ready to give the Capcom what he needed to read up to them before we lost communication again. So it was like you're just racing, 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 and then you've got like 20, 30 minutes you could rest, and then you're racing, racing, racing. <laughs> and they, they orbited for 10 revs. So uh, we, you know, had like no rest. It was exhausting. And our team on the lunar side was very small. It was basically me and one other person. So, you know, we were working enormous, enormously long hours uh, with very little rest. On 13, of course, uh, you know, as it turned out, for what we did, uh, other than it was just a nail biter in general because there were so many problems with the environment and then the great unknown about what exactly happened, okay? Do we have a workable engine or not? And, you know, that was extremely nerve wracking until the maneuvers were actually done because we had no idea how big the damage was to the spacecraft, really until they were close to re-entry. And that was pretty terrifying when you saw the picture looking back when they did separation and found out like half the back end of the spacecraft was gone. But the return to Earth was actually simple for us, okay? We had already, we had simulated uh, using the descent propulsion system for returns. We had simulated doing the ascent engine, using the ascent engine even for returns. 
And that was the whole thing that our program was designed to do, not just to do a return to earth in nominal conditions. It was called the abort program deliberately. That's what its real mission was. They just used it for nominal mission, nominal stuff as well. And the name was changed for political reasons. Uh, changed to return to earth because it sounded too scary to talk about aborts. Our call name in mission control when we first went in there was abort support. And the PR people really didn't want that, to have that you know, handle coming across somewhere, abort support, abort support. So we were changed there to retro support. But um, our program did what it was designed to do. So we have happy customers, let me put it that way. So what are y'all up to? Okay. I can't, you know, mainly I just see numbers. I can't see your room at all in terms of seeing the people. So uh, I don't even know how many of you are out there. Um, I'm we have over 100 attendees right now. <laughs> That's great. You're just little round dots to me. <laughs> I see a few faces. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. When the questions are coming up, uh, uh, some people would like to, you to answer how it was uh, to be the only women in the mission control over there. Like when you got all this press, up, uh, all this attention from press, were you like, why is it happening to me? Or were you delighted to be part of the history? Like you are going to be the first woman. Well, I was sort of saddened that I was the first woman, but someone has to be it. And my feeling about that was, uh, I want to be out there. I want other young women to know that they can do this. I want women to know that they can do these kind of things. And, and having visibility would help people to understand that. One of the real, uh, exciting uh, and delightful experiences that I had during this during the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 was to be contacted by the Brazilian consulate you have a Brazilian consulate here in Houston and I got a call from them and I thought the Brazilian consulate why are they calling me and the woman said we wanted to track you down because we have a Brazilian citizen who works at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. And she wanted to talk to you because when she was a little girl in Brazil during Apollo 13, she saw your picture and read about you and it inspired her to become a planetary scientist. And Guess what? Her name is Rosalie Lopez. She is the world's record holder on discovery of volcanoes. There are volcanoes on the moons of Jupiter and places like that. She's a, a big deal out at JPL in terms of planetary science. And just to know that because somebody had just seen my picture and read a little article, it, it changed their, their attitude about what they could be. That's just an amazing thing. And each of you uh, has the opportunity to be a role model as well. Uh, so embrace it. I mean, it's an exciting thing that you can do that. We also have one, of, uh, one question from our audience. Was there any instance in your career that you felt you were alone in this journey? Well, of course I felt I was alone because I was alone. <laughs> but uh, I, I was alone in the sense of being the only woman. But the other part of it is I was part of a team, okay? And, you know, once you really get involved in the team, 
uh, you just think of yourself as part of the team. So I didn't feel alone in that sense, okay? I was part of a team, and yes, I was a little different. But after a while, most of the people in the team forgot that I was a woman. I was just another member of the team. Now, talking about the present, do you see any difference, uh, like not only in the numbers, but also the respect given and the environment today's women work in, uh, especially in the space industry, than in the past? Well, there's a lot of advances, but there's still a lot of advances that need to be made. Women in, in scientific areas, uh, including the space program, often uh, uh, you know, feel isolated, for one thing. Uh, they complain about mansplaining is another thing they complain about. Uh, they're still probably not paid equally and not having the same promotional opportunities. Uh, some of the women I've talked with said, well, you know, I didn't feel like I could press. I, I just wanted to get in the door, uh, even if I wasn't being paid as much. I, I don't really think that's the best thing to do. I think you need to insist from the get-go that you be paid equitably because you will never catch up if you start off behind, ever, okay? Uh, and we do have more supportive laws. Uh, there is more awareness. It's still difficult for women uh, and has been, I think, especially difficult during this pandemic uh, because uh, working at home uh, and not having your kids in school, having to do the homeschooling, usually those kind of efforts fell mainly on the women themselves. And I've seen lots of uh, articles and mentions about women not being able to finish the papers or the documents that they will, because they're having to, to do childcare uh, in a way that, that men in our society, at least in, in the United States, uh, typically don't participate that much in childcare. I don't know what your situation is in India. Mom, speaking of the pandemic, uh, we would like to know your perspective as a lawyer. Uh, what COVID, how COVID nineteen has reminded us to have a universal minimum wage for all the people out there. I'm sorry, I missed part of that. How has COVID reminded us what? A minimum wage, laws for a minimum wage. Uh about you're talking about raising the minimum wage the need to raise the minimum wage yeah yeah something like that well i mean, uh, i i think that for a lot of uh the lowest paid workers uh in the united states it's become abundantly clear that they need to have the minimum wage raised uh, and companies need to do it, even if the minimum wage itself isn't raised, they need to just raise their wages because we've lost a lot of workers uh, to COVID. Uh, a lot of uh, restaurants, for example, in this country are having a hard time finding workers. Uh, th those are jobs that expose you to the public, they expose you to uh, more likelihood of contracting uh, the virus. Uh, and lots of people have been sick uh, and don't want to take a job where they're going to be that exposed and have to, you know, have risk for their families. So, uh, you know, I'm very much in support of raising the minimum wage. And I don't know how people live on the minimum wage in this country, to be honest. They have to work multiple jobs. Oh, I'm also in the pandemic. We have seen uh, like commercial uh, organizations like SpaceX and Blue Origin have uh, conducted their missions and everything. How has it affected organizations that are supported by the federal government? You were breaking up. I, I heard a mention of SpaceX, but I didn't hear the whole question. Yeah, I would like to repeat my question. Uh, I asked whether uh, how the pandemic has affected uh, federal government's support for the space organizations. 
I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, and I, I think because of the way the budgeting is done in the United States, uh, that, that that's something we're going to see more uh, coming up, uh, you know, because the budgets are set, you know, a year or two ahead of time. So we're really going to see the effect of it as they make budgets now, okay? Uh, the pandemic has been enormously expensive. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the cost of you know, the vaccine development, the, uh, the deployment of the vaccine, uh, as well as the treatments, uh, the, the economic loss, which, which is going to turn around and be a loss in terms of uh, you know, income tax, uh, corporate taxes, and so forth. It's been enormous, so you know I wouldn't be surprised if if there are some cutbacks. Um, but you know exactly what those are going to be is probably going to be determined more in the upcoming budget than in the past. All right, ma'am. So now we have a few more questions regarding space. <laughs> Getting back to space, is that uh. What do you feel like? Where is today's space exploration drive towards? What is their, what are the principles? What is their objective? So, any thoughts on that? Well, in, in the United States, I mean, we've had major emphasis on the commercial development of space, and and you know, there there's some ongoing controversy about that, about the idea of billionaires in space versus uh, accessibility of space for all, and. You know, is this just an ego trip? So I see a lot of talk uh, about those things and a lot of criticism about the billionaires in space thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, having a commercial development in the space program is absolutely essential. Uh, there have been enormous advances uh, that have come about because of competition, uh, even if it is uh, competition among billionaires, it's still competition and it's still driven some great advances. You know, every time I see one of these launches and they and they come down and that with that reusable vehicle, uh, you know, I'm just agog about it because it's uh, so incredible to see that. It's uh, still sort of science fiction to me that we would have this thing and then it would land right on target which is uh, just uh, enormously uh, exciting uh, almost as exciting as seeing our spacecraft come in from the moon you know and and land right where they were supposed to land in the Pacific Ocean and um, I, I know and appreciate how hard that is and, and what incredible technical expertise has been involved so, you know, the value of commercial use of space is just, uh, it, it, it cannot be overestimated. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to all of it going on. I'm looking forward to uh, Mars missions. I, I w did some early work on Mars missions, okay, way back in the 1970s, you see? And then we lost our funding. So. You know, expanding expanding into commercial use means additional revenue supplies. So uh, I'm excited about the future. I would like for the government to, to spend more as well. And I'm happy that to see other governments in other countries, uh, including India, having an active space program. I mean, right now, you know, we have a lot going on on Mars from a variety of players, and that's really good. So I'm coming, adding on to that question and the answer that you gave. What are the most important space projects that you're looking ahead, looking forward for the most in the near future? I'm looking forward to the Webb Space Telescope. Okay, uh, I, I think it's going to bring a, a tremendous amount out of new information about uh, our universe, and uh, I'm very excited about Artemis as well, about really going back and exploring further on the moon. And, you know, we're going to have a little blackout, as I understand it, uh, coming out of Mars because of uh, positioning. 
Um, but that's been very exciting as well to watch what's happening on Mars. Awesome. And one more question from the audience as well is that what was, could you describe the, f- the feeling that you had, just one word, when you saw your spacecraft re enter the atmosphere and land just like planned? <laughs> just one word. Oh. Uh, relief. 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 That's, that's an interesting choice of word, ma'am. Awesome. And we still well, have... All you think about, all you think about when, when you do what I did, okay, all you think about is, you know, there's, there's no victory. You know, it doesn't matter how well everything else went. Until they land back, it's not over, okay? It's not. It's not. Happy Space Week. Happy Space Week to you too, ma'am. And we still have, I don't know, five more minutes with the time left. Uh, just the last wrap question to you, ma'am, is that what sort of advice or what sort of, what do you say, um, just a phrase or warning or just a word of encouragement would you give to the new generation of space enthusiasts, especially young girls from students to college, university level? Would, what, would, what would you tell to them if you had an opportunity to tell to every one of them around the globe? Well, there's there's a motto that's coming out uh, in connection with this space week, and it's aim higher. Aim higher. In other words, you know, set your expectations as high as you can. Aim higher. And I recorded a little video that's part of a montage uh, with a lot of other women uh, that are in the space program these days as well as in the past. And... Uh, you know, what What I said basically was uh, ad astra, to the star. That's true. And don't worry if you only make it to Mars, because you've still gone um, awfully your Keep your aspirations even further than you can reach, because that will just make you get further out there. True. True. Aditi, do you have any more questions left? Just a moment, we'll just check the chat and MST and see if there are any more questions from we the do, audience. Ma'am. We do, ma'am. What exa- uh, the question we have is, what exactly motivated you to become a women's rights advocate? Like you were a space engineer, then you became an attorney, and now a full-time advocate. Well, having been in the space program and become aware of the of the discrimination against women because there was pay discrimination there was discrimination in hiring there was discrimination in in promotion I I was fortunate uh, because I was invisible Uh, invisibility can be a protection against things like that but I was aware that there were a lot of women that were not as fortunate as me and uh, I was in a position where I felt like I could do something. And if you're in a position where you can do something, then you need to go do it. So uh, we weren't going back to the moon. We weren't going to Mars. So I decided I would a new trajectory. And, uh, you know, fighting for women's rights is even more difficult than getting to Mars. Mom, we have one more question from our audience. What do you think about today's Alyssa Carson as the first girl selected for Mars Generation? I, I repeat the question. What do I think about what? Oh, uh, what do you think about today's Alyssa Carson as the first girl selected for Mars Generation, the future Mars mission? I'm still not quite sure exactly what you're asking. I know you're wanting to know something about the Mars missions. What do I think about the Mars missions? Uh uh-uh. uh. It is uh, about Alyssa Carson. She has been selected as the first girl for Mars Generation mission. Well, I think that's I think that's great. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see more women going. Uh, 
Uh, it'd be okay with me if we had an all-female uh, mission. Okay. I, I really don't like to have slots uh, designated. I think that uh, they shouldn't say, for example, uh, that they're going to put the first woman on the moon. Uh, I mean, it might be an all-woman mission would be, you know, a possibility. I think that women should just be competing for the jobs uh, rather than having designated slots because uh, historically when you have designated slots, they designate a maximum, not a minimum. Um, but, you know, certainly we should have, you know, I, I fully expect we will have many qualified women and I look forward to them being up there. Um, some of our audience would like to know that how we can qualify to work in a space program at NASA. Like you entered as a computerist, as a mathematician, how we can contribute to any space organization in the world? Well, I mean, they have, NASA has a lot of stuff and, and I don't know what you have in terms of your Indian space program as well. You probably have a number of things as well. The, what's interesting is that there's so many ways that you can become involved, uh, ranging from a graphic artist to a communication expert, engineer. I mean, there's a, there's a whole array of, of backgrounds that can contribute to the space program. Uh, it's not just do you fly or uh, you know, do you work in the control center. And there's, there's uh, in in the NASA program, they also have, they call them NASA ambassadors or space ambassadors where you organize local events. Uh, the Brooke Owens Fellowship is really excellent uh, and gives you lots of uh, opportunities to become involved. They have a lot of internships, including human high school in internships that are available. And organizations like SEDS, for example, uh, do a lot to increase the opportunities for people uh, entering the space program. All right, ma'am. So with that, we are, we come to an end to this session. One hour has passed by and I would like to take this time to thank you, first of all, for making time for us today. And thank you again for the audience to being in association with one and asking questions to, to know more about our guest's journey and what she believes in. And frankly, we believe the same. The points that you mentioned about how she felt relief after the spacecraft landed back to Earth and how she believes that having an all-women team uh, in the next mission is something that we all can get behind in the near future. So I'd like to thank you again, Mrs. Northcutt, for Miss Northcutt for taking time. And thank you again. Thank you and have a good space week.